Uh, okay, so uh, this is going to look at the behaviourist perspective. So in the behaviourist perspective, um, just like all the other assumptions, uh, all the other approaches sorry, that you've looked at, there are assumptions that you'll need to know. Um, so everything that we've looked at so far, the individual differences, approach, social approach, etc. They're all called approaches. Uh, we're going to look at two which are perspectives. And the perspectives are really very old um, ideas in psychology. Um, so they are perspectives on, on the way humans work, basically. Um, so in terms of assumptions, the behaviourist perspective is also sometimes called behaviourism. Um, and it was founded by John Watson and based on an idea that behaviour is learned. So the behaviourist perspective is based on the assumption that when you are born, your mind is what you call a tabula rasa, which means a blank slate. So in other words, there are no behaviours um, or attitudes or th thought processes which are built into you, which are innate. OK, um, so obviously your biological processes work. So you know how to breathe and you know how to digest food and your heart knows how to pump blood and all those kinds of things. But in terms of like behaviours and thought processes, there is nothing which is innate. So all behaviour is learned through the environment and conditioning. OK, um, now conditioning essentially means learning. Um, so conditioning occurs through interaction with the environment and our behaviour being shaped by our responses to stimuli. And by stimuli, we essentially mean um, variables or things, okay? Um, so it assumes that behaviour is a result of stimulus response association. And in order to understand this result of stimulus response association, you need to understand the different ways of learning. So they are operant conditioning, classical conditioning and social learning theory, which we'll look at in more detail. Um, and another assumption here is that only observable behaviour should be studied um, if Sorry, that should say psychology is to be considered an objective science. OK, so behaviorists would argue that if you are interpreting unobservable constructs, then it's likely that your research is not going to be scientific um, and it is impossible to to measure accurately. Um, so you can't measure a thought process. Therefore, if you're going to study behavior in a falsifiable way, then you must look at only that which you can observe. OK, so that is behavioural output. So we're going to look back at those three uh, theories. So those three ways in which behaviour can be learned. So there's classical conditioning that we're going to look at first. So classical conditioning uh, was discovered by Ivan Pavlov. Um, and you may remember this from GCSE Science. So classical conditioning is learning through association. So a link is formed between a stimulus and a response, okay? And um, Pavlov's research was done with dogs. So, in Ivan Pavlov's research, uh, before conditioning, uh, there is a natural response, okay? So remember I said that those biological functions exist. Yes, you're born as tabula rasa, but your biological functions exist. So before conditioning, and that means before any learning has occurred, if a dog is presented with food, this would be the unconditioned stimulus. And if you then present a dog with that unconditioned stimulus, it will produce the behavioural response of salivation. OK, so they will produce saliva. Um, now, this is called the unconditioned stimulus and unconditioned response because biologically, you produce saliva to break down food when you eat it. So when you see food, when you start eating food, you start to produce the saliva. So no learning has taken place yet. Now, during conditioning, what Pavlov started to do was ring a bell every time food was produced. OK, now the food here is still producing the unconditional response. So that's still the unconditional stimulus and the unconditional response. And then we like match it and pair it with this bell, which was actually a neutral stimulus before. But actually during this, the bell is beginning to um, 
conditioned behavior okay so if you pair this stimulus repeatedly over time then actually we will learn an association between the bell and the food so that means that after conditioning when Pavlov rang the bell but produced no food they started to salivate so the learning has now taken place uh, and the bell on its own will produce saliva so salivation has become a conditioned response rather than an unconditioned response so it's always unconditioned to start with then the process of pairing during conditioning and then after you've done that conditioning process the conditioned stimulus will produce a conditioned response so in other words they've learned to salivate each time the bell was heard okay um, so I'm going to get you to pause the video here and watch um, another video. Um, so in this video, uh, somebody is developing a phobia. So what I want you to do is watch this video first. And then we'll fill this out. OK, so um, before conditioning, the unconditioned stimulus and the unconditioned response. So this is uh, the natural stimulus and response. So um, if the steel bar was smashed, that would produce a loud noise okay, or hit, that would produce a loud noise. So in unconditioned stimulus, I want you to write loud noise. In unconditioned response, the response that that loud noise produced was fear. Okay, so unconditional response is fear. Then, during conditioning, we pair that with a stimulus which was at one time neutral, so he wasn't fearful of this before, but we pair it with a white rat. So where it says condition stimulus, please write white rat. And then the unconditional stimulus and response appear the same. So we pair the white rat with the loud noise to produce fear. If we do this enough times, so repeatedly, then after conditioning, the conditional stimulus is the white rat and the conditional response is fear. So he's learned to associate this neutral stimulus because it's been paired with the unconditioned stimulus with the same response of fear. Okay, so try and have a go in the next task at applying this to David. So have a go at task three on your own. Uh, so David, once while having a fill in the drill hit a nerve. So every time David goes to the dentist, he is frightened. Use the principles of classical conditioning to explain how David's phobia may have been developed. So pause the video here and have a go. So you should have come out with something along these lines. Um, so before conditioning, he um, experienced pain. So when the drill hit the nerve, that would have been painful. So the pain has given the standard response of fear. Then during the conditioning, so during this experience of pain, the dentist is neutral, but has been paired with that feeling of pain to produce fear. And then if that was to happen again, then actually the dentist can be the condition stimulus and that can lead to a condition response or a learned response of fear. Okay, so that is classical conditioning. So please remember that classical conditioning is learning through association of, of variables or stimuli and responses. Operant conditioning is slightly different. So operant conditioning was dreamed up by uh, B.F. Skinner and Edward Thorndike. Okay, so B.F. Skinner agreed that behaviour was learned. So he agreed with Pavlov's principles that all behaviour is learned, but said that you learn through the consequence of a behaviour rather than through association. So he did a lot of research on animals, um, and he based his idea on. Uh, an idea called the law of effect. Um, so the law of effect um, essentially suggests that if a behaviour has a positive outcome, it will be repeated, and if a behaviour has a negative outcome, it will not. Okay. 
So um, he based it on this law of effect and looked at positive reinforcement, negative reinforcement and punishment. Okay. So here are the definitions of those things. So these are in your booklet. So positive reinforcement strengthens a behavior by increasing the chance of a behavior occurring again. Negative reinforcement strengthens behavior by the removal of an unpleasant stimuli. So reinforcement, and make a note of this in your booklet because it is important, reinforcement strengthens a behavior. So reinforcement encourages that behavior to happen again. It makes that behavior stronger. So an example of positive reinforcement might be, uh, let's use cleaning your room as an example of a behavior. So positive reinforcement would be if I gave you five pounds every time you cleaned your room. That means that I'm strengthening the behavior because I'm making that behavior more likely to happen by increasing the chance of that behavior occurring again by giving you a reward. So I'm introducing something that's positive as an outcome to strengthen the behavior. In negative reinforcement, it strengthens the behavior through the removal of an unpleasant stimuli. Uh, so for example, if you're aware that um, your mum's always walking around and complaining that your room is messy generally, so she just whinges about how messy your room is, then I strengthen the behavior of you cleaning it because it removes that idea that your mum's going to nag. So you know your mum's going to complain less if you get on and tidy your room. So you do. Okay. So I'm just removing something that's there and isn't very pleasant by strengthening the behaviour. Punishment is a little bit different. So punishment is where you in, like essentially in extinguish a behaviour. So punishment gets rid of a behaviour, stops a behaviour from being repeated. So positive punishment weakens the behavior by giving an undesirable consequence. So, for example, if you um, were shouting out in class, I might use positive punishment by introducing detention and keeping you behind after college. I might use negative punishment, which is the weakening of the behavior through the removal of something desirable by saying that because you've shouted out in class, that means that you uh, can't go on the school trip next week. So I'm taking something away that was desirable. And both of those things would uh, potentially stop you from doing that in the future. So we'll have a go at applying to some of these scenarios. So in the first one, a child is throwing attention because it wants a biscuit. Okay. Uh, the mother gives the child a biscuit and uh, the tantrum stops. Now, what that child is going to do is that child is going to repeat that behaviour in the future. OK, so that's inevitably going to happen. So what mum has done is mum has introduced the biscuit. So she's provided something and it stopped the tantrum. But that means that that child will have a tantrum in the future. So she's made the behaviour stronger. So it's reinforced the behaviour because it's more likely to be repeated. And she's done it by introducing something positive as an outcome. So she therefore has used positive reinforcement. Okay. Uh, a teacher awards gold stars for people's work. Again, that would be positive reinforcement as I'm trying to encourage that behavior to happen again by giving you a desirable consequence. Uh, taking paracetamol for a headache. Um, so if you have a headache and you take paracetamol away, it will remove a, a negative factor. So it's going to take the pain away. And that means that next time you have a headache, you're likely to repeat that behavior. So you're likely to strengthen the behavior of taking medication. So as I'm strengthening the behavior by taking away a negative consequence, that would be negative reinforcement. Uh, getting a fine and points on your license for speeding. Okay, so I'm trying to stop that behavior from occurring again. So I'm trying to stop you from speeding by introducing an undesirable consequence. Okay, and therefore that's positive punishment. Uh, 
same i've already really mentioned this one giving a student detention for not doing their homework so again that's positive punishment i'm introducing something undesirable like punishment as in uh student detention and it's there to stop you from not doing your homework in the future receiving applause for a performance so you receive applause that's a positive outcome and it may mean that you're more likely to perform in the future so that would be positive reinforcement Uh, number seven, applying sun cream before you go out in the sun. So if you go out in the sun and you have sun cream on, it removes the possibility of you being burned by the sun. Um, and therefore, next time you are likely to reapply the sun cream. So that would be negative reinforcement because it's encouraging a behavior. You're going to keep wearing sun cream by removing a potential negative impact. Uh, number eight, not letting a football player play for the rest of the season for biting an opponent. So this would be punishment because we're aiming to stop them from biting again. So we're aiming to be an extinguish of, of behaviour. Um, and we're doing this by removing something desirable. So we're removing their ability to keep playing football. So that would be an example of negative punishment. Uh, going to prison for breaking the law. So if you break the law, we're wanting you to not do that in the future. So again, we're wanting to extinguish that behaviour. And we are doing so by introducing something negative. So we're introducing a prison sentence. So that would be positive punishment. Uh, taking away a child's chores because they did well at school. So they did well at school. We want them to do well at school again. So we're encouraging that behaviour. And we're doing so by taking away the removal of an unpleasant stimuli. So uh, that would mean that that's negative reinforcement. Take away something negative to encourage them to do something in the future. OK, and that's operant conditioning. So they're the four kind of principles that you really must know. And then you've also got social learning theory. So social learning theory basically suggests that learning is influenced by a mixture of um, kind of psychological factors um, and behavioural learning factors. So it states that you learn through simple processes of observation and imitation of role models. OK. We have looked at this before. Now, Bandura suggests that these four processes are really important. So these are in your booklet. So in order for that social learning theory to occur, um, and how, how like, much you will imitate those observed behaviours depends upon these things. So it depends upon um, attention. So in order to learn, you must be paying attention. We should all know that one. Uh, retention. So you must be able to recall the information. So if you can't recall that somebody else had had a negative consequence of their behaviour, um, then you're not going to be able to actually... Um, decide use that to decide whether you're going to imitate the behavior or not uh, reproduction so you must actually be able to perform the behavior that you've seen and motivation so um in other words being motivated to imitate the behavior through reinforcement or punishment so do you have any reasons why you would be encouraged and that's what it means by motivation to actually reproduce that behavior now the motivation when it talks about reinforcement or punishment um, we have talked about this before, but you are not directly in social learning theory ever reinforced or punished. But instead, the reinforcement and the punishment is vicarious. So by vicarious, it means that you have seen how the model was punished or reinforced for their behaviour. So that would be vicarious reinforcement or vicarious punishment. So let's have a go at applying some of these. So in the first example, you see a beauty product being advertised on the TV and you buy it next time you are shopping. So in this, for example, often when you see uh, beauty products advertised on TV, uh, they either make you look absolutely fantastic. So they'll talk about like, how much your skin glows or how soft your skin is, things like that. Or they'll be advertised by a very kind of glamorous celebrity. Now, 
if they're advertised by a glamorous celebrity, so write some of this in the box underneath, if they're advertised by a glamorous celebrity, then that would be an example of somebody who you might see as a role model. Uh, now, if it's advertised by one of them and actually their skin does look fabulous or talks about how silky your hair gets after you've used this product or something like that, then actually they're having a positive outcome of the behaviour of using that product. So they're being reinforced for their behaviour, either through being a beautiful, rich celebrity or through having extremely silky hair after using a particular conditioner. Um, and that would mean that if you observe that role model, you are more likely to imitate the behaviour by buying it next time you go out shopping. Uh, next example, a child sees his brother being rewarded for a good school report and so tries harder at school. So again, the big brother can act as the role model. The younger brother observes that behaviour um, and the motivation is that he sees the older brother being rewarded and so he's vicariously reinforced and will imitate the behaviour. Uh, next one. A daughter copies her mother and cooks dinner on her pretend play kitchen. So again, the mother may appear to be a role model to the young girl because they're similar and also, you know, they're related. It's someone who the, the young girl may look up to. And so when she's observed mum, she will imitate that behaviour. And the last one there, male and female siblings are playing dress up. Both put on dresses. The female is complimented by her father and she's told that she looks pretty. The male is told that he looks silly and he's asked to remove the dress. Okay. Um, so here, for example, um, now this can be kind of reinforcing for both of the children. So if the male is told that he looks silly and he's asked them to remove the dress, then actually that reinforces for the young girl that she should continue to dress in that way because that's how females dress um and the male he sees that the the sister the, the um the female sibling is complimented by father and told that she looks pretty while at the same time he's punished so then he's kind of vicariously um learning that he should not dress in that way so this is how social learning theory basically works with with and gender stereotypes and gender roles so you can learn gender roles through how people who have conformed to those gender roles appear to be um, reinforced and rewarded and those who challenge gender roles appear to be punished and then that in turn vicariously can reinforce or punish other people and teaches them how they should dress and how they should conform to their gender role, essentially. Um, so in terms of um, models, uh, now these role models are normally people who um, are either similar to us or they could be more powerful to us or they could be kind of nurturing to us or they could be of the same sex, okay? So role models could be things like parents, uh, but they could also be people who are similar to you. So, like, females will usually use females as role models. Males will use males. Um, they could even be kind of your peers. So people who are the same age as you could actually be your role models. So you'll imitate your friends' behaviours. Uh, people who are more powerful than us, so celebrities, or even kind of people in powerful roles like the police and firemen and things like that. Those who are nurturing to us, your parents, um, and I've already kind of said those of the same sex. Uh, 